are um, going through our series at the moment called uh, called No Other Name. And throughout this series, uh, this series is also going to be extended now due to some of the, the date changes. But we, um, we have been looking over the past few weeks at different names that God has been given throughout the Old Testament. Um, and these names tell us something of the nature of God's character. Um, but the beautiful thing when we uh, move from the Old Testament to the New Testament and see Jesus, his life in the, in the Gospels, we actually see that through the life of Jesus, he is the one who most fully demonstrates and lives out these aspects of God's character. And we started our series by understanding that this name, Jesus, this is now the name that is above every other name. So the names that we are looking at in, uh, in the Old Testament now, Jesus, he has been given the name above every other name. In Philippians 2 verses 9 to 11, we see these wonderful verses which says, Therefore God exalted him, that is Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is what we centered our, uh, our time around in the first week of this series as we looked at Yahweh Elohim, which means the Lord of Lords. Then a couple of weeks ago, um, Ash continued our series by looking at Yahweh Ra, which means the Lord our Shepherd. Then last week, Dave continued our series by speaking about Yahweh Shalom the Lord our peace. And today we are going to be looking at Yahweh Rapha, which means the Lord who heals. This is sometimes pronounced as Yahweh Rafi. Now, um, some of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, today um, might be a little bit theological at the start, but I do want to reassure you that what we're going to be speaking about today, this is immensely practical. There are things that we can all walk away with and know that God is able to do something through every single one of us. And the way that we see this name, Yahweh Rapha, um, first introduced throughout Scripture is in Exodus 15 verses 22 to 26. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to open up to Exodus 15. We're also going to be, uh, yeah, it will also be up there uh, on the screen. Now, at this point, um, just for a bit of understanding of where we find ourselves here in Exodus 15, at this point, Moses has, uh, has just led the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. They have been guided by God to, uh, to the Red Sea. And God has parted the sea so that the Israelites uh, have a clear way to walk through. The Israelites made their way through the Red Sea as the waters were parted. The Egyptians chased after them, um, trying to to stop them. Uh, But then God, once again, as always, he saved his people through uh, through allowing the uh, the sea to come back and swept the Egyptians away. Um, Then at the beginning of Exodus 15, where we find ourselves is the moment immediately following this. There is celebrations and songs being sung to God, thanking Him for, uh, for, his, uh, for His goodness and His faithfulness to His people. And then in verses 22 to 26, we begin to see the people of God, the Israelites, starting to make their way towards the promised land. And so this is where we uh, pick up in verse 22. It says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went to the desert of Shur. Now, I just want to pause right there for a second. This desert that they found themselves in, it is a very, very dry, difficult place to be walking through. So we just need to be aware of that as we we read this. For three days they travelled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. This is why the place is called Marah. Well, as it says right here, Marah, it literally means bitter. So that's why it's called that. Um, So the people grumbled against Moses 
Apparently it was Moses' fault, saying, what are we to drink? Application point one from our sermon time today. Don't grumble, Moses doesn't like it. We continue. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling, an instruction for them, and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. In the original language, I am Yahweh Rapha. The primary way that we see healing spoken about in this section of Scripture is regarding physical healing. And the way that this um, unfolds itself uh, through this uh, and throughout all of Scripture is by seeing that God is able to heal physically in two different ways. Firstly, God is able to heal supernaturally like he does here. God comes and intervenes in a uh, a divine, powerful way to make this water okay to drink. But the second way that God is able to provide healing to his people is by providing guidelines for this group of people, these Israelites, who would have had no understanding of medical doctors um, and medicine and the, the things that were needed to, uh, to stay healthy and flourish as a, as a group of people as they're wandering through, through the desert. Um, uh, often when, uh, when people who have recently come to, to know Jesus um, and they pick up the, the Bible, and they begin reading it from, uh, from the start, sometimes uh, if people do this, they can get quite confused with some of the things that they are reading. Um, if you are new to faith, can I just recommend the best place to start is in the Gospel of, of Mark. Because I've found if people just pick up the Bible and start reading it from the very beginning of Genesis with no real understanding of what, it is, uh, of what it's saying in the context it's written in, it becomes a little bit strange because when you start in Genesis, it sounds wonderful. There's all these supernatural things going on. Some people might feel like it sounds a little bit mythological and not really understand what's happening right at the start, but it picks up when you get to Abraham and, uh, and his descendants, and you start to understand a little bit more about what's going on. Then you get to Exodus, and if you've seen The Prince of Egypt, your mind will be brought back to that movie, and you'll sing songs along in your, uh, in your head, and you'll enjoy reading through the history of what happens in Exodus, and then, and then you get to Leviticus. What is that about? And then you get stuck in numbers, and then Deuteronomy. These books that just feel like this massive slog to get through, and if you're new to reading Scripture, you'll just be wondering, what on earth Does any of this have to do with what Jesus spoke about when he said, love God and love people? It can be easy when we come to these books like Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy to read them through our eyes and not understand the context because uh, there are some confusing laws uh, from our eyes that are given to the people. But we have to understand there are multiple reasons, a lot of these laws throughout Leviticus and uh, and following, there's a lot of different reasons that these laws are given. But I just want to talk about one reason that some of the laws are given and one of the reasons that some of the laws throughout these books are given was to protect God's people, to help them to flourish, to help them um, become everything that God wanted, wanted them to be as a nation. We have to remember when we look at these, uh, at these books that they were 
um, was spoken to a group of people who were walking around the desert, a huge nation of people who were walking around the desert with very little understanding about hygiene, medical practice and what practices and what was needed to be healthy. And when you have an entire nation wandering around the desert for 40 years, it is a prime place for disease to come and, uh, and make its way in that nation and then to wipe the nation out. Now, this nation of Israel was God's primary way of working his redemption story so that the whole world would be able to have uh, the salvation that Jesus brought. But if the nation had um, had disease throughout their time in in the desert, the Bible would stop in the book of Exodus. So, for example, one example of where you might find some uh, some guidance that God gives to his people about, um, about having healthy practices is in uh, Leviticus 15. In Leviticus 15, I'm not going to read much of Leviticus 15, it's a little bit full on, but one thing I think we could all understand is one of the laws that God gave, which was if someone spits on you, go and wash it off. Okay, I think that's a fairly logical thing for for God to have given his people. And it's things like this that we see throughout God's laws that were there to help the nation of Israel flourish and become everything that they could be. This is part of the reason in verse 26 of what we have just read. It says, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. This verse of what we just read, it's partly demonstrating that through obedience comes blessing, but it's also um, for us with with a bit of hindsight, uh, it helps us understand that God wanted his people to obey his laws and his decrees so that the nation didn't die out. So God is able to heal supernaturally, like he does with the, um, with the water here, but he also uses natural means to provide health and healing to his people through medicine, doctors, hygiene, and just simply being, uh, being smart. Um, I've heard of, of some people um, who avoid any... Um, natural means of, uh, of healing and health. And the primary, way, the primary reason that some people avoid these things is they, because they say that God will uh, only desires to heal people supernaturally um, and only does this rather than healing people through natural means. But God has provided us with good things like medicine and and doctors, so that us as a, as a people are able to flourish. The Lord who heals, Yahweh Rapha, he heals both through supernatural and natural means. Now, what I've said just then is pretty straightforward. If we get a headache, most of us will be inclined to go get some Panadol or some Nurofen, um, And these are good things that God has uh, provided for us so that we might have health. But where things begin to get a little bit um, more difficult and, uh, and confusing and even controversial is when we move from speaking about just natural healing and start speaking about supernatural healing. These moments when God comes in divine power and intervenes in the world and provides healing for people. Now, this is the way that God provided healing for his people in this passage. Moses threw some wood into the water and the water became drinkable. It was no longer, um, it was no longer uh, bitter. But throughout the entirety of the Bible, there are 
countless. There are so many passages that speak about God's supernatural healing power um, that are evidence of God being the Lord who heals. The Lord who heals, a few different ways that it's spoken about throughout uh, the Old Testament. God heals physically, he heals emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. There are ways that God heals supernaturally that are um, broad and uh, and all-encompassing. Now, God has always been the God who heals, as we see there um, in, in the book of Exodus. But the time we see God's healing power most fully revealed is through the life of Jesus. In Luke 4, what Jesus does is he goes to the synagogue and he presents what is essentially his mission to uh, to the people who are gathered there. And one of the things that Jesus says uh, about the reason that he has come to the earth was to restore sight to the blind. And the moment that we see Jesus really living this out is in John 9. So if you have your Bibles, turn from Exodus now to uh, to John 9, and we'll be looking at verses 1 to verse 12 in particular. And John 9 verses 1 to 12, it says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him uh, begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they call Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Immediately following what we've just read in John 9 from verses 13 to uh, 34, we see um, the Pharisees' reaction to this. So the man is brought before the Pharisees and the Pharisees are in utter disbelief. There is no way that this is a true healing. Even with the evidence directly in front of them, they refuse to believe that Jesus healed this Uh, this person. And so we see a few different reactions to the healing of Jesus here um, in John 9. We see uh, the attitude of the man who was healed. We see the attitude towards the healing of the Pharisees. We see the attitude of the neighbors who were there. And we see the attitude of the disciples. And these different attitudes towards the healing that Jesus did here, I think... Um, many of us would be able to relate to in our, own, uh, in our own world today. On one end of the spectrum, you have the people like the Pharisees who believe that God never heals. Under no circumstance does God ever heal. Even today, there are people who would, um, who would assume that Uh, who would say, sorry, that God never comes in supernatural power and heals people. Now, the reason that some people can, um, can say that there is no way that God does supernatural healing anymore is because that was only for the apostles and the foundation of the church, 
They might say that 1 Corinthians 13 teaches that there is no place for healing and that, uh, that healings have, have ceased. All supernatural work of God has ceased. I don't find that personally a very convincing argument because... Uh, Part of the reason I don't find that a convincing argument is because the sheer amount of teaching that we see throughout the New Testament regarding healing is um, is so broad and so vast, I don't think that God would have given us Scripture here today and for us to read this teaching and then us to think, oh, that was only for back then. Another reason I don't think that that is a... Um, a valid way to understand healing today is, uh, is because um, it was not only the apostles who were doing healing in the early church. In Acts 9, we see Ananias who heals Paul. So it's clearly not only, um, uh, only apostles who do healing within the life of the early church. Jesus is also fairly clear, even at the end of this passage in telling the Pharisees who don't believe that this healing took place that they themselves are spiritually blind because they won't recognize the power of God at work. So that's one end of the spectrum where you have the the Pharisees in this passage. The other end of the the spectrum, uh, there might be people, there there are people who believe that God always heals. Under every circumstance, God will heal everyone, no matter what, uh, what it is. And uh, this belief um, is also often coupled with what the disciples say here, which is that any uh, healing, any time that someone isn't healed, that that is because of a lack of faith or because of sin in, uh, in their life. The disciples, their attitude is, if there wasn't something wrong with this man's relationship with God, well, he never would have, would have been blind. I have particular issue with this understanding of the healing power of God because of the way that this can be abused, and I have personally seen it uh, abused. So, as an example, I may have shared this with you before. Um, I have a friend who was born with, uh, with diabetes. And uh, after being born with, with diabetes, the, the thing that his parents heard more than anything else wasn't care or concern, but there were many people who went to them and told them, the reason that your son has diabetes is because of sin in your life. There is unrepentant sin, and this is why your son is unwell, which totally contradicts everything that Jesus says here at the beginning of John 9. Another example, I, have, I had someone who was very, very close to me, a dear, dear lady who was very close to me, who, uh, who ended up dying of, of cancer, And as she was dying of cancer, the thing that she was told most regularly by people was um, there was not enough faith in her life. And if she wanted to experience true physical healing, she would be able to be fully healed of this cancer and that she needed to give more to the church. She ended up, this lady who is very dear to me, She ended up dying believing that her faith in God was insignificant and she ended up giving every single piece of her her finances to the church uh, on her, her deathbed. But I would say here, in John 9, verse 3, Jesus is immensely crystal clear. Neither this man, this person who was blind, nor his parents was... Uh, the, the, his, his blindness was not caused by sin. I would say it's clear throughout Scripture that God doesn't always heal physically. He doesn't heal us from everything that we endure. Many of you joining with us online and joining with us in person, you might have been going through sickness 
and you may have been praying for someone who may have been sick for years and years and years. And God will heal people according to His will, according to what He chooses to do. Now, God doesn't always heal physically. I would say this is true in in Paul's life. Paul spoke about a thorn in his flesh in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7. It's It's generally understood that this would have been a physical ailment that Paul was going through. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 6, we see some of the last moments of Paul's life as he's writing to a young Timothy and he is saying that his life is being poured out like a drink offering, knowing that he is going to die soon. So Paul, who had healed a huge amount of people, he endured physical pain, sickness, hardship, knowing that it wasn't God's will to heal him. This is why in John, 1 John 5 verse 14, we see, and this is the confidence that we have before him, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now I would say that most of us Probably, us, uh, us Baptist people, generally we wouldn't fall into uh, either of these camps. But I would say the people that we would probably relate to more in John 9, as we read through this, wouldn't be the Pharisees, it wouldn't be the disciples, but it would be the neighbours. Because the attitude of the neighbours throughout this passage is... Did this healing really happen? Like, we we know that God is is able to heal, but I I don't really, really see it happening too often. That's the attitude that we see here in the, of the neighbours. And I would say, I have more often than not probably fallen into, into that camp, where I know God can heal. I see it in Scripture, but I don't see it happening around me all the time. And there's multiple reasons we might uh, place ourselves in a camp like that. We believe that God is able to heal because we see it in Scripture, but we get wary of too much talk about healing. Maybe the second reason that we might fall into this camp, we just don't really see that much healing take place in in the world around us. Or maybe we might, fall into, uh, we, we might fall into the trap of thinking that we're not adequate enough to really earnestly pray for God to intervene and provide supernatural healing for someone. Maybe we, our understanding of what it means to pray for healing is not, uh, is not as it is in Scripture. And I would just say, in regards to that last If you feel, for some reason, like you are inadequate to pray for supernatural healing, for God to come in power and heal someone, I would say, I would point you to 1 Corinthians 12, where there is a lot of talk about spiritual gifts. And um, I would just let you know that uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, the gifts of healings are not spoken about like the other gifts. So, for example, I would say I have the spiritual gift of administration. It's one thing most of you would find immensely boring in your life. Um, And this is something that I have. I am able to be an administrative person because God has given this to me. But the way that gifts of healings is spoken about is different. Because every single gift, every single healing, sorry, is a gift that has been given to that person to then give to the person who needs healing. Every single healing is a gift. So every single one of us can pray for a healing gift in any particular situation. And it's for all these reasons that I think we some of us, I take not all of us, but some of us may need to move the pendulum back a little bit and have the attitude of the man who is healed here in this passage and just simply accept that God is the Lord who heals. 
God is the Lord who heals. Why do I believe this? Why do I believe that God still wants to heal today? In John 9 verse 3, so that the works of God might be displayed. God wants to work in powerful ways so that people will come to him, believe in him, and worship him as their Lord and Saviour. I was, on a, um, I was on a youth camp once, and um, we, had a, we had a guest speaker on this camp that I was, was on, um, a, a very charismatic uh, brother of mine. It was wonderful to, to have him come in and share, uh, bring God's word on this, on this camp. Um, and one of the boys who was there on the camp, he had um, a really um, messed up ankle, and this was preventing him from being able to do a huge amount of, of things on this, uh, on this youth camp. And this, um, and this uh, friend of mine, who was the, the speaker on the camp, um, he, uh, he just went over to him and called some of the other, um, the other youth around this, this boy and began to, to lay hands on his ankle and began to, to pray for it. Um, after praying for it for a while, he asked him, look, have you... Have you experienced any, any relief of pain? And the boy said, yes, I, I have experienced some, uh, some relief of, from pain. And so this guy, he continued to pray for, for this ankle. And in the meantime, the administrative part of myself was thinking, we've got a time schedule, let's get going. We've got some, some stuff we need to, to get to. Um, but this, uh, this guy, he continued to pray for, for this, um, this young boy's ankle. And in this moment, we were able to experience full healing. The power of God came in a, in a mighty way, and there was healing that took place in this, uh, in this young boy's, boy's ankle. This boy, he was not a follower of, of Jesus, but seeing the power of God at work in his body, that was one thing that led him to have um, to believe in Jesus there on, uh, on that camp. Now, this is just one example, and many of you would have experienced examples of God's supernatural divine power in healing people. And some of you may have never experienced this uh, in your life before. But I would encourage you when you pray for, for someone, like many of us do, when you pray for someone, for God to heal and restore someone to, to health or restore their, their spirit, what you are doing in that moment, you are calling upon the creator of all things to come in supernatural power and to intervene directly in this world. Why? So that the works of God might be put on display for all people to see. Praying for health for someone, praying for healing for someone, these are not throwaway prayers or something that we just add on to a list because we feel like we have to. These are these are prayers that we are offering up to God, asking Him to come in power. And then our role is to simply step back and watch what takes place. Because what takes place here at the end of John 9 in verse 38 is we then see this man come back to Jesus. He believes in Him and he worships Him. He doesn't just experience physical healing in this moment, but a deep spiritual healing takes place. So it's not just his physical eyes that are opened, but his spiritual eyes are opened. And this is why God heals, so that his power will be revealed, so that people will worship him, and so that more people will believe in him. And this morning, I just want to um, speak to, to us uh, speak to three different groups of, of people. You might fall into, into one of these groups. Some of you might be here uh, this morning and you might be in need of absolute spiritual healing. 
your spiritual eyes might still be blind and you haven't understood that Jesus, in all of his grace and mercy, has come to this world to provide salvation for you and that you might believe in him. Through believing in Jesus, you can know salvation and your spiritual eyes are able to be opened and you can experience spiritual healing. So some of you joining with us online might be in that camp. Some of you here this morning might be in a camp of knowing that God is able to heal, but you just don't see it as often as you would like. And you might be in the, in the place where you are wanting to see um, his supernatural power working through you more and more. But the last group I want to, um, to speak to today, and I'll be praying for all of these, these different groups. The last group of people I want to uh, speak to today is for any of you um, this morning or joining with us online who might be in need of physical healing. There might be an, um, an ailment or a, or a sickness that has been with you for years and years and years, um, and maybe you haven't experienced healing. God doesn't guarantee that every person who is sick or unwell will be healed, but he calls us, even in James 5, calls us to pray for those who are in need of physical healing. And I'm going to to do that for us uh, today. Um, Originally, when I was thinking about this sermon, I was hoping that we might be able to to have people um, lay hands on those who are sick and need healing, but with our current COVID circumstances, we're not going to be doing that. Um, But what I am going to ask is that anyone who might um, want physical healing for themselves or physical healing for a loved one, I'm actually just going to ask you to stand and we are going to join together and we are going to pray for you. So I'm going to ask for those of you who are joining with us online that if you are in need of physical healing or you know someone who needs physical healing, that you might take part in this as well, that you might stand and we might pray for God's power to be at work. So if you just want to do that right now, if you are in need of physical healing and are wanting um, us to pray for you, I'm just going to ask you to stand right now. What we're going to do this morning is our brothers and sisters stand, um, uh, stand here. Um, if we can just, all of us, just reach out a hand to, uh, to our brothers and sisters this morning. Um, we can't lay hands on you this morning for, for obvious reasons, but we are going to pray right now for God to come in supernatural power and to, uh, to come in and heal. Team, if you want to come on up, that'd be great. God, for, uh, for my brothers and sisters here this morning and who are joining with us online, who are in desperate need of healing, whether that is physical or, or emotional or, or mental or spiritual, whether they are standing for themselves or standing on behalf of someone else. We call upon you right now. Almighty, powerful, great, merciful God, would you come? Would you heal as only you are able to do? As people reached out for your cloak, Jesus, desiring just a touch of you to experience your healing power, would you come and provide that touch here this morning? Would you do that for us here and by your Spirit, do it for those who are joining with us through their TV screens as well? Increase our faith, please God, knowing that you are a good father 
who has good things intended for his children and that you are able to do immeasurably more than we can ever ask or imagine. Come, great God, provide your healing power. We ask for it. We yearn for it. But we also know that your will is greater than our own. And so no matter what happens from this this morning, we ask that we will worship you. We will believe in you. That we might have a greater understanding of the power of God. Particularly, I just have a real sense right now, God, that you are wanting to provide healing here this morning for someone who's been dealing with depression. And God, I do pray right now, will you heal their mind? Whether they're here in person or online, God, heal their mind. As only you are able to in a supernatural, powerful way, please, God. Intervene in that person's life. For all of us, God, we do want to experience more of your healing power in our spirits. And we do ask for the things that are spiritually sick within us, that we might cast those off might experience your healing power. And we pray all of these things in the name that is above every name, in the name that is above all things, in the name of Jesus. We pray these things. Amen.